let's say we get hurt one time in the past, but then we dwell on it and feel like a victim a thousand times in our mind. We're just cutting ourselves a thousand times. So learning how to say, all right, I'm going to drop this thinking and choose positive thinking for what's in my life today in the present and making positive choices for the future. This is By Joy We Joy and Season 2, where joy gets stronger, our community gets bigger, and together we become better versions of ourselves in a world full of limitless possibilities. I'm your host, Joanne Chan. And every Wednesday, we bring you inspiring stories that will light up your soul, powerful messages that will make you go wow, and fun conversations that will crack you up with me and my special guests and friends. And it's my personal mission to empower you to live and lead a life with joy. If you are new here, this podcast is for you. If you are looking for more joy, courage, passion, and purpose in your life, we dive deep into mindset mastery, spirituality, love and relationship matters, and how to manifest more success and abundance in all aspects of your life. However that looks, this podcast has got your back every step of the way. Now, without further ado, get ready to love, learn, and live your life to the fullest. I'm so excited that we have another podcast host in the house today, and he's none other than the charismatic host of the Top 5% Global Podcast, The Good Mood Show. And with his soon-to-be-released book, Choosing Good Moods, he reveals the secrets to achieving your best self, conquering challenging emotions, and creating a positive mindset. Beyond his inspiring work, he's a dedicated husband and father of four, juggling a thriving entrepreneurial career while overseeing a team of nearly 100 employees. And he's here today to share with you the power of choosing good moods and the lasting peace and happiness are within reach. So guys, help me in welcoming the host of The Good Mood Show, Matt O'Neill. Welcome to the show. Oh, man. Man, Joy, thank you for that amazing introduction. I'm so excited to be here with you and your thriving podcast. Yeah, I love reading your bio because it's all about having, you know, happiness, joy, and good mood. So I, I've been reading a good mood now that I am having you on my show, you know. <laughs> I'm in a good mood just talking with you. You've got such a wonderful energy about you. And we, as as you know, your name means happiness. Yeah, yeah, totally. Thank you so much for that. So you see... Um, what is really a good mood? Like, is it energy or is it an emotion? How would you define a good mood? Yes, a good mood is the absence of bad moods. <laughs> so when we're when we're caught up in negative energy, we know what that feels like and it doesn't feel good. So anytime we're not feeling good, we're believing some kind of thought that is an untrue thought because the truth of everything ultimately is that the world is here for us. Like God has created us to feel good. And when we're not feeling good, we have a misperception. Wow. Okay. So what inspired, why are you so passionate about this topic? Like this topic specifically, like what inspired you to focus on a team of choosing good moods in your podcast and even the upcoming book? Yeah. You know, it's really uh, my family line. So my, you know, it goes all the way back to my grandfather who came over to the United States on a boat from Ireland in the early 1900s. His, uh, his parents died when he was young and he was an orphan on the streets of New York. And he felt a lot of shame because he didn't think he deserved a mom. He didn't think he deserved a dad. And at the time, the Irish, uh, having an Irish accent was a bad thing because so many people had immigrated from Ireland to the U S that he had fierce discrimination against him. And, uh, and then, and then he ended up meeting someone else, my grandmother who also lost a parent and her mom had to give her away just so she could try to survive. So she felt this deep shame that she wasn't enough to deserve parents and they fell in love and had babies. And then what did they do? They made sure their babies knew they weren't enough. And my dad was one of those babies and he grew up with like really bad moods. He didn't think he was worthy of, of love or good things. And so when I was born, he was awful. You know, he was really mean to me. He was abusive emotionally and physically. He was abusive to my mom and to my siblings. And I didn't think I was enough. 
So I spent my life in school trying to get good grades to prove that I was worthwhile because inside I didn't feel worthwhile. And, um, you know, in, in high school, I did have really good grades, but I still didn't feel great about myself as a person. And I was interviewed for the high school yearbook and they said, Matt, Hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? You, you know, you're doing so well. You're one of the people we think is going to succeed in, in life. And I said, I just want to find happiness. And so it's been this lifelong quest. And, um, from that point, I, I didn't, I didn't find it. I fell into uh, drug abuse and alcohol and, uh, and, and really went into a pretty dark path because I was trying to find ways to be happy in an easy way. But I had to wake up and it, was, it came in the form of a, of a few books. So when I was 25, uh, a book called Think and Grow Rich landed in my hands and I started to see that, oh my gosh, my whole life is being created by my thinking. And I got another book called The Secret by Rhonda Byrne, and she started to talk about how our thoughts and our feelings attract the life to us. So from that point, I started to read everything I could about how my thoughts and my feelings were creating my circumstances in life. And it's been a now a 20-year quest to find the sources of authentic happiness. And, um, I, you know, I just, I just love it. And so what, what I learned and the easy, we can boil it down to this circumstances in life are not always going to go the way we want, but if we are enjoying our life or not is not about the circumstances. It's about our perspective of those circumstances. Right. Okay. Let's talk about that. So let's say, um, somebody's in the, in the bad circumstances right now. Right. And he or she might be going through some really difficult, I would say, situation, right? Or challenging, um, yeah, some challenges, right, in life. And how 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 can a person change their perception so that they can turn something so negative into something positive? Well, let's uh let's talk real world. Mm -hmm. Joy, you've had challenges in your life. Yeah. I've had challenges in my life. What's a emotionally challenging situation that you've gone through? For me personally, it's uh, depression. Yeah. Yeah, depression is a really tough one. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you get lost in depression, what are some of the thoughts that are showing up there? Um, suicidal thoughts and um, feeling of just overwhelmed with sadness and, and mm. despair and emptiness. Yeah, so there was a there was a book written in the 1990s called Power Versus Force hmm. and by David Hawkins. And David describes the 16 levels of consciousness. And it, in the 16 levels of consciousness, the lowest one is shame, and that's the one I talked about that my grandfather and grandmother and father all had that they didn't feel they were enough as they were. Above shame is guilt. And guilt is this feeling that I've done a bunch of things wrong and I deserve to be punished. Those are pretty destructive, but usually when you're in shame and guilt, you want to hurt other people. The next level of consciousness above shame and guilt is hopelessness. And this is what you're describing now. And in hopelessness, you uh, the circumstances of life seem so great that you don't have a hope that the future will be brighter. Yeah. And beyond hopelessness, the next emotion is sadness. So we get to into this, we can get into a cycle of hopelessness and sadness, feeling like life won't get any better, and then feeling really sad about the situations. And that's a cycle of depression. And uh, David Hawkins describes really beautifully how to how to continue to progress beyond these emotions. And the next emotion that we need to get to is an emotion of desire. And in desire, and it's hard, like it's hard. I, I've battled hopelessness and sadness myself. And I, I talk about it in my podcast, The Good Mood Show. I've got an episode called Conquering Hopelessness. And I had a suicidal thought. You know, I, I things, the circumstances in my life last year became so desperate and dark. I had lost $330,000 in six months. We were losing money every single month. My stepfather was going through cancer he passed. I ended up uh, having a permanent injury in my shoulder. Like everything just felt like it was stacking against me. And I eventually lost hope. And I was driving home and I thought, I don't care if I get into a car crash right now. 
you know, and this is, these are suicidal thoughts. And so that's, that that was a wake up call that, Hey, I'm kind of stuck in this emotion of hopelessness. Well, when we get there, the only way out is to hang around people who are at a higher frequency because we can't pull ourselves out of (laughs) despair. And we can't, it's when, when we get stuck there, we need help. And, uh, and that's what I did to get out is I, I started to think of anyone that I knew that, that cared about me and also was in a higher frequency feeling like positive emotions. And I just wanted to spend time in their energy field so that their higher energy would pull my energy up. And, and that's, uh, that's what I recommend. Anytime we're feeling hopeless, life is not actually beyond hope. There's always hope. And we just need to call on people that, uh, that are feeling in a higher level than we are and ask them to help us. And, and, and people who love us will. So that's how I got out. And, um, and so beyond hopelessness is this emotion of desire and desire is awesome because once we get there, we start to desire a better life. And from there we can set goals. And as soon as we start to set goals, we start to see hope again, that life will be better. And then we start to take action towards those goals. And then we start making our life better and it starts to be an upward spiral. And that's how we get out of depression. Well, that is so true. And I, I could totally relate to that. But it's really interesting because you mentioned about, um, you know, how do we get ourselves out of that cycle of depression, sadness, and um, and hopelessness is that we have to hang around with other people who are positive, right? And who are at a higher frequency. But of course, I know now that you are a big believer and you read books on law of attraction, manifestation, and all that stuff. So when we are, you know, when we are negative, quote unquote negative, right? We will only attract people who are also negative, right? Because we only attract mm. people who are on the same level of frequency as it. So and um so that is really interesting when you mentioned that, right? When you are in a negative state of being, you want to hang out with positive people, right? But that is not usually the case, right? Because you wouldn't really attract that. If you're unco- yeah, Joy, if yeah. you're unconscious. If you're unconscious, you'll continue to attract people back to you with your frequency. But if you're conscious, if you under, if you've read the law of attraction, if you understand that, hey, in this cycle of depression right now, I will unconsciously attract more people to me that'll make me feel depressed. But I'm conscious to that, so I'm going to consciously think who are people that are happy and enjoying life and are feeling great, and I'm going to ask them if they'll help me, and they will. People, people love to help. And as soon as you, as soon as you get around their energy, it's the law of attraction, right? Their energy affects your energy and you get pulled up. You don't even know how, I don't even know. I don't know how it works. It just does who we hang around influences our energy level. And so as soon as we get pulled into a higher frequency, we can then start to set goals. And and if you set goals and start taking action towards them, you get out of hopelessness because you're like, oh, wow, okay, I see a brighter future and I see that it's possible for me to make it. And then it's, and then it's a self-fulfilling prophecy and our life gets really great again. Yeah, so true. So you see, not many people who are in the bad moods that they are not necessarily wanting to go and talk to another you know, person, right? Sometimes we just want to be with ourselves, right? Which is okay. So what would you say there are some other strategies that that person... Um, can implement so that we can i would say not rely on another person to right. help us become you know improve our mood but how, what, what else can we do to improve our mood in, in one of my episodes of the good mood show with krista carpenter uh, krista was very vulnerable about reaching this place of depression and wanting to end her life and she did not call on other people mm-hmm. uh she's she it, you know got to the point where she couldn't get out of bed and she's, she just described, she said, finally, she just kind of said, screw it. I'm not going to be here that much longer. I'm going to stop doing what other people think I should do or what I think I should do. And I'm just going to do one thing today that I want to do. And, uh, and she said, I'm not going to like put pressure on myself to go work out. Everybody says I should be working out. She's like, I don't feel like it. She's like, well, I kind of feel like painting. And so she, she started to paint. And she didn't go to work because she was too depressed to go to work. She didn't exercise because she was too depressed to exercise. But every day she said, I'm going to do one thing that I, I kind of want to do. And, um, and that's how she pulled herself out. She would paint. And then one day she did feel like going outside and taking a walk. And as she, every day as she did one thing that, 
that she authentically wanted to do, um, she eventually pulled herself out of the darkness without the help of other people. But this is this is going back to the same thing we were just talking about. What, in essence, what Krista did each day is she set a goal for herself. The goal was, I'm going to paint today. And then as she painted, she felt good about herself. And the next day, her goal was to go for a walk. And as she did, she felt good about herself. And so it's it's kind of the same exact process, just not relying on others, just doing small, simple, achievable goals on a daily basis. And that then it boosts your self-esteem and starts to show you that you actually can create a future you want to create. Yeah, I know you talk about goals a lot. I mean, like throughout, even throughout these conversations. So what is really the, the relationship between goals and happiness? Does it mean that the more goals we set and as we achieve our goals, the more happier we'll become? You know, there, there's... A, I'm sure you know that right? people say, you know, I will only become happy, you know, when I become successful, when I achieve this, when I have that. So what is really the relationship between goals and happiness? Yeah. Yeah. So desire is a bad mood. <laughs> so I'm talking about I'm talking about setting goals as the pathway out of depression. It is. But if we stay stuck in desire, in this emotion of wanting more, mm. it's insatiable. So we can never uh, we can never fulfill our happiness with external achievements. And so there's more levels to happiness beyond setting goals. And uh, so so in my book, I talk about each of these emotions and I talk about how we have to use desire in a positive way to get out of the lowest of the five emotions. But then when we get to desire, we can't stay stuck there. So beyond desire, the first good mood is um, is the mood of humility. And in humility, we start to see that we start to have a humble gratitude to the force that has given us the opportunity to live. Uh, to me, I call it God. It doesn't matter what your religion is, what your spirituality is. You can call it the universe. But once you're humble to see that, wow, my life was gifted to me. I didn't, I didn't deserve it. You know, I didn't create it. Somebody or something created me and I get to live this life it, from that humble place. We start to say, okay, well, now what am I going to do to help others? And then we start to get into higher moods. So the next, the next great mood is this mood of confidence. And we grow confidence by deciding to live a virtuous life that we admire. Uh, typically, that means um, not hoarding money not trying to like be number one and beat everybody, but rather like virtues. So a virtue of kindness, a virtue of generosity, a virtue of giving, a virtue of, of loving, you know, a virtue of making other people feel good. So as we live an admirable life, and this is, you know, it's all levels. So you can't just, you can't be in hopelessness and say, well, I need to be more virtuous because that just adds weight and pressure on top of your hopelessness. You have to get yourself out with a desire for a better life, start achieving goals. And then once you get to the stuck in more and more and more and more, only then can you say, well, wait a minute, this isn't what I really want. What I really want is to feel good. And we feel good by living admirably. So let's get like really, you know, um, get down to the steps. You know, how do we then move from one level, the lower level to the, you know, um, upper level? Like let's say someone is in the shitty mood right now, right? I can say <laughs> So like really bad mood, right? Um, what what is the first step? What does the first step look like to shift ourselves up? Uh, well, for me, it, this all is so much easier if you have a if you have a pen and a paper. Mm. So I start every morning with a with a pen and a paper, and uh, and it's it's consciousness. We have to be conscious of how we're feeling. So the first step is awareness of what am I feeling. Most people are unconscious. If we don't if we don't create space every day to ask ourselves how am I feeling and what's going on inside my body, what's going on inside my heart, what's going on inside my mind, then we're just unconscious. So we're usually just unconsciously in a bad mood. But every morning I start with a pen and paper. It's a journal. It doesn't matter. It could just be a pen and paper. And uh, and I have a, a, a practice where I ask myself what's going on in my energy, like where what am I feeling in my heart? Do I feel agitated? Uh, what's going on in my mind? Am I ruminating about something? And I just have space to just write about how I'm authentically feeling. And from that space, I can then say, okay, 
Well, if I am agitated, I know that that's just my own thoughts. It's not the circumstance. It's not the situation. So what are my thoughts that are causing me to feel this way? Uh, you know, it, and it's, it's all different. If I think somebody hurt me, well, then my thoughts about them hurting me are what's causing my pain, not what they did to me. So then I want to examine those thoughts and then turn them around and, and see how really it's my thinking that's hurting me, not them. Mm, yeah, exactly, right? Because no one can make you feel a certain way, right? Because it's it's your own emotion, right? You choose to feel this way. So I'm so glad that you mentioned that. Yeah. So then how do we change? Like, how do we go from, okay, awareness to, I would say, uh, with, with awareness that comes a choice, right? We can always choose again. Would that, you know, would that be the next step? Like, how do we choose another emotion? Yeah. Okay. So, so typically what we do to ourselves all day, and this is, this is because of our survival brain. Typically we look at everything that went wrong mm -hmm. and say, uh, that wasn't good. I w I'm not good. I didn't do this well enough. I said this wrong. I was so stupid in this situation. Well, it, everyone does this because this is how we survived and how our species like made it in the jungle, right? If we made one mistake, if we grabbed the wrong berries, our whole tribe could die from poison berry. Yeah. So we had like, we were always vigilant about never making a mistake. Um, and we were always looking for what could go wrong. Like, like if there's a tiger in the bush, we could get killed by that tiger and then we could die. And so we, we our biology is to constantly scan what's going wrong. Well, if we don't wake up to that fact, we'll stay feeling bad because we'll always be say, seeing what we did wrong and what's going wrong. So I counteract that again with my journal. Every morning, the first thing in my journal, I write down three things I did well the day before. Is our brain doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to our brain what, what we did right. It's yeah. like, okay, that one's going good. I don't have to focus on it because that's good. I, I, you know, I just need to look at what's not good. So to counteract this negativity of the brain, I start out every morning and I say, what did I, I just think about yesterday? I'm like, yesterday, what did I do well? And um, so I'll, I'll sit here right now because I did this this morning, but I, I can't always recall. It just becomes a daily habit where you're like, okay, every single day, I'm going to count the things I did right. And what happens is you start to feel really, really like positive about all the things you're doing right. And you stop focusing on all the things you're doing wrong. My brain now all day, is scanning for what I'm doing right because it knows tomorrow I'm going to have to come up with three things I did right. So in the moment, it's starting to catch me doing good things and I become naturally more positive instead of negative in that situation. The other mood that is everyone talks about because, it's, it, because it works, it's gratitude. So after I write down three things I did right, I write down three new things I'm grateful for. So every morning I, I just, I put my hand on my heart and I actually feel my heartbeat. I say, thank you for my heartbeat. It's a gift today to be here. And then I say, I write down what, like authentically, how do I authentically feel grateful for new things I have never written before? And it, again, now my brain all day is scanning for what I'm grateful for. When we do this every single day, and I've been doing it every day for a decade, all of a sudden you start to notice what other people are doing right instead of what they're doing wrong. You start to notice what you're grateful about everything. Every problem that happens, you start to be like, oh, wow, I'm actually kind of grateful for that because now it's helping me grow and become more. And, it, and so these two practices start to escalate our life in a way that, that make everything become a positive. Yeah, but you know, for some people, I'm saying, you know, maybe just a few people who are listening to this, they might be thinking, yeah, but you know, it's something that uh, even a friend of mine said to me recently because um, he told I'm all about like positive thinking, you know, it's all about, you know, uh, because of my podcast, right? And I said to him, no, it's all about being authentic, right? So how would you address critics who argue that positive thinking is toxic? Yeah, uh, inauthentic positivity is toxic because the underlying emotions could still be of depression, let's say, as we were talking about earlier. We could feel depressed inside and, and feel like, you know, hopeless inside, but then walk out around a public with a big smile on our face and like pretend everything's okay, but we're dying inside. So that's not, that's, that's not what we're talking about. In order to be authentically positive, we have to be real. And this is why I recommend starting with that journal and saying, how do I really feel? And if I really feel hopeless, then, then let's start to imagine the thoughts about what that is. And then uh, and then get myself out of that 
because we got to be real, right? So, but the other side of it is, uh, you can't just go ahead and say the, the critics to positive thinking um, are like, well, I'll just say that life sucks because it does, and that way I'll never be disappointed. And so then they're always pointing out everything that's going wrong. That's no way to live. Mm. Do we always want to be saying everything sucks and that 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 life sucks, and then you die, and then and you ask them how they're doing, and they're like, I'm hanging in there. They're like, oh, it's just okay, man. Well, I'm getting through this week. <laughs> can't wait for this one to be over well we live that way and we just get through our whole freaking life and then we die never being happy that is no way to live so yeah. the only the only sane option is to be real with ourselves when we feel bad to recognize that it's our perspective that's making us feel that way to set goals for a better future and then to start to live in a way that we feel really proud of ourselves and to choose a positive perspective of everything that happens it's just, it's a daily, daily practice. It's every single moment making a conscious choice to say, how can I see this in a positive light? Because that's the only thing that is sane. It's the yeah. only thing that feels good. And I refuse to waste one of my very few precious days in despair. Mm, yeah. You know, good and happiness seemed fleeting in today's world because we can get something, we buy something and we feel happy for a minute and then we'd be like, what's next right so do you believe that we can truly you know the quest to happiness right do you believe that we can truly um arrive you know or reach a point or a state of being where we are truly happy and peaceful with everything in our life do you believe that exists or is or is a journey so that's enlightenment mm, yeah and and enlightenment would be I see every single thing that happens as beautiful and perfect. And uh, I'm not there. I I can't love every person unconditionally. You know, I can't love the monster who is harming others intentionally and see that they're perfect and beautiful the way they are. At this point in my evolution, I'm not ready to do that. You know, but but what I can do is is see that, hey, somebody who's hurting someone else is hurting themselves. And that can give me some understanding for their situation and maybe some compassion for how much pain they have. And then if if they hurt me or someone I love, say, all right, well, dwelling on this pain isn't going to help me feel good. And deciding to stop the thoughts that are hurting me now, like let's say we get hurt one time in the past, but then we dwell on it and feel like a victim a thousand times in our mind. We're just cutting ourselves a thousand times. So learning how to say, all right, I'm going to drop this thinking and choose positive thinking for what's in my life today in the present and making positive choices for the future. So I don't think unless you're enlightened and there's a handful of people, like maybe five or six in the whole world at any given moment who are actually truly enlightened beings, that everything looks beautiful to them. Uh, unless you're one of those five or six out of seven billion. Uh, the, for the rest of us, we need to uh, just be conscious of when our thoughts go negative, examine them, and then start to say, well, that's not serving me. So what thoughts would? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So, yeah. So, so you know, you are also an entrepreneur and um, leading a team of 100, 100 employees. So how do you lead and inspire your team of nearly 100 people? And how do you foster a positive, because I know some of my listeners, they are still in a job, you know, in the nine to five, they are not all entrepreneurs and business owners, but they are still in a job, right? And um, some of the things they will tell me is that, you know, their colleague is doing this to them, you know, it's a very toxic environment. So how do you, as a leader, foster a positive and healthy and productive environment based on everything you just shared? Or like, how do you, do you ask them to do a gratitude, you know, write journal? Or... Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question. And, um, it, and it's 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 a very relevant question because if you do work with somebody who's toxic, you can have all the positive thinking you want, but man, it's hard to be around somebody that's undermining you. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's it's just really really difficult. Um, so I recommend removing yourself from toxic situations, and uh, I recommend leaving jobs that have toxic cultures. I'd rather make less money and work in an environment that's really happy and supportive because mm. at the end of the day, my happiness is my currency. Money doesn't matter. We can always make more. I'm not going to be a slave to money and, and suffer 
to make it. That's that's living in you know in it, that's living in chains. So in my environment, yeah, there's a hundred people. Not all of them are happy all the time, but I do get to consciously choose who I let into my company. And when and I did set the core values in my company, and the first core value is integrity. So people who are going to do the right thing uh, for others, and the second core value is kindness. So people who are going to be kind to others. I select people who are going to do the right thing and who are going to be kind. And if somebody in my company is not kind, let's say, you know, they consistently put others down or they consistently harm others with their behavior, we ask them to leave. And that is fault that has fostered an environment that it has made us one of the top workplaces in the state of South Carolina for five years in a row. Wow. We were actually awarded the number one place to work in the entire state of South Carolina a couple of wow. years ago. But it's it's really just of ed, you know, selecting people who already are kind and allowing kind people to be in my circle. I can't change it's very difficult to take somebody who's perpetually unkind and say, I need you to be more kind. Like that's an internal shift. And usually people don't change like that unless a major life event occurs. Like they get a cancer diagnosis or somebody has a horrific accident or some major life event that then they have a wake up. Like, holy cow. Like I always think of uh, Ebenezer Scrooge, uh, you know, on Christmas and he got scared so much that he decided to change. Like you need an Ebenezer Scrooge moment in your life to scare you into deciding to be kind if you're unkind. That usually doesn't happen. So just don't spend your time with unkind people. So yeah, you talk about core values and I love that because in one of your videos that I watch, um, you talk about that, right? You need to have, you know, establish your core values so that if you, if every day you just do one thing that live out to your core value, you will be in a good mood, right? So talk to us about mm -hmm. that. Yeah, uh, I set core values for my company and, and when you set core values, you only want five. Usually we can go too big and we could, mm. we could try to set seven or 10. It's too many. You can't remember seven or 10 by heart and live by them. So I highly recommend five and no more. So I've set five core values for my company. And then those guide who we allow to be in our company and they guide our decisions. So if we're ever in a situation like yesterday, I was on the phone with somebody who was, um, he was, he was unhappy. But knowing that I've got a core value of kindness, it guides my conversation, even when he's unkind, for me to give him compassion and kindness while he's feeling stressed and unkind. Um, so that's that's in, in our, our workplace. But I think it's even more important to set that core values in your home. Mm. And I set five core values for my family. Uh, my wife and I set them together when our children were young. And we said, who do we want these children to become? Who do we ourselves want to be? And so the five core values at home, uh, the number one is be kind. We, we want to be known first and foremost, O'Neills are kind. Mm. Uh, number two is be brave. I want to be courageous. I want my children to be courageous, to face their fears and then do the hard thing, even when they're scared. So this week, my eight-year-old got up on stage in front of the entire school wow. and sang a song and played piano on stage with all the eyes of all the children looking at her. She was so nervous, but with the core value of be brave, she strengthened her muscle of courageousness. Our third core value is do the right thing. So as a family, sometimes things look kind of gray. We don't know what's black and white. You know, maybe you're at a party and everyone is, is doing drugs mm. and you're like, you got this peer pressure. Well, you know, is it the right thing to do drugs? Hopefully my children from instilling this in a, in a very early age, do the right thing are going to say, that's not the right thing. And hopefully that core value will guide them to a life of happiness because drugs won't get us there. Uh, the next core value is be healthy because we can, we can set all the goals in the world, but if we don't take care of our bodies, if we eat the wrong foods, if we don't exercise, you know, um, we can lose all our energy to do anything great. So be healthy is the next one. And, and our last core value is to have fun. Okay. What's the point? What's the <laughs> point of being such a goody two shoes all the time if we don't enjoy it and laugh and be goofy and play games and just and just have fun because that's what life really is here for. 
there's I've, I've done so much contemplation about what's the meaning of life. Like, why are we here? I truly believe we're here to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. And, and I think we're here to grow and evolve. And mm-hmm. that's Tony Robbins is one of my, uh, is one of my mentors. Oh, today's his birthday. And you do like, oh, today is? Yes. Happy birthday, Tony. Yeah. yeah it's like once in a four years because he's a leap year baby. So. Oh, he is a leap year baby. Okay, he great. Is. Well, Tony said his definition of happiness, he said, happiness equals progress. Yeah. So he said, if you're progressing and growing, you're happy. And think about that for a minute. If you're progressing in your career and you're getting better and you're advancing, you're probably happy with your career. Mm. If you feel stagnant in your career and you're not progressing, or maybe you feel like you're going backwards, you're not happy in your career. Well, same thing with your marriage. If your marriage is progressing and becoming more exciting and more loving, and you and your spouse are growing in the same direction, that you're really happy with your marriage. If your marriage is declining, you're not happy with it. So his definition of happiness is happiness is progress. That's why I think um, progressing in all areas of life, especially like emotional growth, is one of the keys to happiness. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, now I know you are a big personal development junkie, and so am I, which is why we are connected, and which is why you are you have a podcast, you have a book. So when is your book coming out? Yeah, November of 2024 is our release date. I'm uh, I'm working feverishly hard with the editors right now. Okay. Uh, because we really want to have like I, I want these principles I'm talking about now to be so crystal clear in the pages of that book that anyone is going to walk away and understand how to make their life happier. Mm. So can you share maybe just one strategy that you're going to share in the book uh, with our listeners today? <laughs> Give them a bit of preview or, you know. Insight. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so I, when I, I, in the chapter of how to choose love, uh, you know, I, anytime I think of someone loving, I think of Jesus. Jesus loved everyone. Like he just, he just loved everyone. He loved the Romans that were persecuting people. He loved the person, Judas, who betrayed him. He loved the, he loved the prostitutes. He loved the people who were down on their luck. He just loved everyone. And so, and he, and he didn't not love everyone. It's just beautiful. He just loved them. Didn't matter what they did or who they were. They just loved, he just loved them. Well, that's not always accessible to me. I can't always just love everyone immediately, but um, I, I can love people the second time. So what I mean by this, um, I tell a story in my book about how uh, my wife and I got into an argument. I wanted to stay and watch the fireworks on the 4th of July. She wanted to go home and get the children to bed. Well, I'm like, oh, honey, the fireworks only happen once a year. Like let's, we can keep the kids up one night and experience fireworks and yeah, they'll be a little cranky, but let's do it. And she said, no, they're going to be so cranky. We're going to have a miserable time tomorrow. We're going to go home. Well, we got into an argument. I was not feeling very loving towards her as I drove us home. She wasn't feeling very loving towards me as I was upset with her. And we got into this like kind of cold stance and this happens, right? Sometimes we don't agree with people and and then we don't think they're right and they don't think we're right and and we and we're not being loving. But my recommendation is to notice that, notice when we're no longer loving and then choose love second. So if we can't choose love immediately and we notice that we're not loving, notice it and decide to choose love second. So at that night as we're not talking to each other, uh I, I did a meditation and I imagined that um, the next day my wife was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And I started to cry just thinking that I only had a few days left with her. And, and I started to think about my children and me at her funeral. And by the time I got done with that meditation, I got up with just these tears in my eyes and I thought, the only sane thing for me to do in this moment is to go give her the biggest hug I can and say, I'm so sorry, because we don't know how much time we have left with people. Mm-hmm. And immediately that thought that I could lose her ended all petty drama because we don't know how much time we have with people. And if we're not loving them, we're not being smart and we're not being sane. 
Yeah. Wow, that is beautiful. I mean, thank you so much for being real and honest and, and vulnerable with that story, you know. And it's not just, you know, with our partner, right? It could be with our family, you know, parents, kids, right? Siblings, anyone, right? Anyone. Coworker, coworkers. Yeah, co yeah, your boss. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you don't you don't know. It, and we also don't know the pain they're going through in the moment. Exactly. Right. Sometimes we think somebody's being a jerk and yet they're dealing with such a hard situation. If if we knew the pain of anyone's life, we would never wish them more pain. Yeah. We would only wish them more love. Mm, beautiful. Well, thank you so much for I mean, I I I would love to talk to you for hours, right? We can but we can always have you back when you have your book um released in November. We would love to have you back and talk about the book. So thank you so much for bringing so much joy and positivity to our show today. But we this is not the end yet. We always end with our final five rapid fire questions. So I usually ask the same question to all my guests, but I have slightly different question for you today. Uh so every question has to be answered in one word or one sentence maximum. Got it. Okay. The first question. Joy, is joy, joy, before we begin, I just have to let you know, you are a joy to talk oh, with. Thank you. Your, your energy is so fun. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's that. So um, I believe my listeners will, will agree with you. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. All right. Okay. Okay. Ready. What is the best piece of advice that you have ever received about happiness? The best piece. That it's a choice. Hmm. Love that. Second question. What is the worst piece of advice that you have ever received about happiness? <laughs> that it's unattainable. Wow. Who told you that? <laughs> yeah, my brother. He said, Matt, life is shit and then you die. And he's my older brother. And so, and it's interesting when, when, when we're kids, we can take on these early impressions from our from our heroes and it takes a lot of effort to undo what we learned as kids wow yeah precisely precisely yeah we, i feel like we haven't talked about beliefs yet you know like we should really you know dive deep into that topic but yeah next time the next question is if you could live your life all over again what would you do differently i, I always say nothing because mm -hmm. i'm so happy with where it is yeah yeah in fact this, this is the answer that i always get from my guests like it's nothing because without all the experiences i wouldn't be who i am today right so yeah and i love and i love all of it i wouldn't take i wouldn't take any of the lessons back wow that's really powerful yeah the next question what is something you're trying to learn or curious about right now i i'm reading the book 10x is easier than 2x by ben hardy I'm learning how growing exponentially is actually easier than growing incrementally. Wow. I'm going to buy that book. <laughs> it's great. It's phenomenal. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm looking for book recommendations. So thank you so much for giving me that. Yeah. The last question is, you're going to love this. What brings you the greatest joy? Oh, man. I, I almost got a little teared up just thinking about that. It's It's my children and my wife. Yeah these authentic relationships are the source of joy in life. Yeah. Yeah. I can see the tears in your eyes. Right? So mm -hmm. it's, yeah. Yeah. Of course my listeners, they wouldn't see that if you are not, you know, watching the video, but all right, guys. Um, I hope you like this episode. I'm, I'm sure you love this episode. Otherwise you wouldn't be listening to the way. Right? And so tell my people where they can find you and connect with you. Best place is the podcast. Uh, I would love to have you guys continue the good mood conversation at the good mood show. You can find it on Spotify or Apple or any of your podcast apps. Yeah, I will put your links in the show notes below. So guys, make sure you visit the show notes and check out all the amazing things that he is doing, you know, and buy your books when it's out. Listen to his podcast. I'll put all the links in the show notes below. I already said that. Anyway, um, I hope this episode gets you into a good mood and we would love to hear from you as always. So take a screenshot if you're listening to this and, you know, share it on the IG story. And so let me know what is your biggest takeaway from this episode. Remember to like and subscribe to this episode, to this podcast. So you will never miss another episode coming to you every Wednesday. And I will always leave you the same way as I leave you every other episode. Show up. The world needs you and you need you. Thanks for listening and I wish you all a joyful and amazing day ahead. 
Thank you again for tuning into Find Joy Joanne podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, take a screenshot and share it on your IG story and take Find Joy Joanne underscore podcast so I know you are listening. And leave us a positive review on Apple Podcasts if you haven't already done so. And remember to hit the subscribe button whether you are listening on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon Music or any of your other favorite platforms. If you love what we are doing and want to become one of our sponsors, you can send me a DM to connect. And thanks for being here. I will see you soon in the next episode.